Now it's time for questions. Yeah, Ed. Uh, I appreciated your, y y the way you described Dworkin's similarity to Berlin. Uh, that was precisely related to my critique of Dworkin's conception of liberty. However, in defense of him, and it didn't seem to me that you touched this part of his argument, was the claim or suggestion that an appealing conception of liberty, one that we would want to put in our constitution to subscribe ourselves to, wouldn't feel any loss, uh, any tragedy, in the fact that liberty doesn't encompass things like to rape, murder, maybe pollute, and so that it getting a right interpretive conception of liberty was something that was a worthy ambition, uh, putting aside the particular interpretation of liberty that he uh, reached. Uh, by, uh, uh, my, my quest in this paper uh, is, I guess, um, it's in some sense to understand the extent, if any, to which Ronnie Dworkin um, could be classed as a libertarian, right? This is someone for whom the question of infringements on total freedom, right, matters in some way. It seems to me if you, if you take the position that what defines an occasion for justification is X, total freedom has been infringed by an action of the community, by a legislative or regulatory action of the community. Um, that something of significance um, occurs there. Now, it's not surprising. Um, my sense is that for Dworkin, total freedom has to be a normatively charged notion because the combined ideals of equal concern and respect for responsibility already contain within them an affirmation of values of human agency and self-direction. And those values are going to stand potentially at risk whenever total freedom is, is, uh, is politically um, restricted. Um, and I don't see how you can draw the line somehow or other at laws against murder. I use the example of spitting on the sidewalk. You have to look and see. You don't know a priori, right, that the law against murder um, meets Dworkin's standards of justification. You actually have to check. And why is it that we're obligated to check? Because that's a coercive law. I think that's the reason why we're obligated to check. Um, but that was my question, right? This was a, there's a question mark after that. Is that why I go, um, Dick Fallon, uh, uh, in an exchange with me, uh, gave the example of a law that changes the state bird from the swan to the goose. <laughs> um, I don't think Ronnie's gonna say we have to go and check and see whether that law is consistent with uh, equal concern uh, and respect for responsibility. He's going to say it doesn't have, you know, that uh, it doesn't apply there. But I think it does apply to the law against murder, you know, the law that's going to hold Ronnie responsible uh, for murdering his critics uh, <laughs> if, he, if, he, if he chooses to do so. So there's a question. Um, there's a question there that uh, it doesn't seem to me uh, gets an answer. Uh, in chapter 18 as it stands, and what I mean to be doing is pushing Ronnie in the direction of saying a little more um, about this. Yeah, well, uh, can I change the subject to majoritarianism? Oh, thank you. Um, the disparagement of majoritarianism by critics sometimes, I don't, I don't know when, um, seems to view the populace as relatively flat in terms of economic power. And um, if you make such an assumption, then majoritarianism and minoritarianism both seem like silly, it don't have anything to do with fairness, I suppose. Um, if one assumes a um, minority rule, such as in South Africa for a long time, 
um, then majoritarianism starts looking a little better. But but more basically, if you just assume a a, a social organization that looks like a pyramid rather than a flat populace, where the people at the top are numerical minority and they're um, and they're very wealthy and control a lot of resources and power, then majoritarianism starts looking like a rough way to ensure that the interests of less powerful people have some force in the democracy. Majoritarianism, for example, seems more likely to generate a progressive tax system. The features of the US Constitution that are most anti-majoritarian may have historically been about um, protecting all sorts of noble interests, but it might have been about protecting privilege. So that's the first point. The second is that the word majoritarianism sometimes means this decision procedure of counting heads, but I think it also is sometimes a shorthand for just ordinary politics, negotiation, discussing, discussion, and compromise among people that then culminates in a vote. And if it's viewed in that larger way, it seems to me to have um, to have substantial moral dimensions. Um, and then third, it, majoritarianism seems like um, a sort of rough cut at ensuring that the interests of the governed are what's moving this stuff. Um, there's a surprising moment to me in Dworkin's book in which he um, acknowledges that the representation of all states in the Senate with two senators in spite of radically divergent populations um, is a bad rule because it doesn't adequately, because it leads to inadequate representation of people who live in states that are dominated by urban centers. And that's right. I was surprised that he said that. I thought he would come out on the other side of that one. But his point, which was well taken, is that there's no decent remaining, historically current, justification for this. And it does indeed have the impact of, of diluting the representation of the interests of many, many, many people. And this is the most radically anti-majoritarian feature of, of our government. Can I just quickly? Uh, to, criti to criticize majoritarianism isn't to defend minoritarianism. Uh, I mean, neither one uh, are adequate standards. And it's common ground, actually, that, uh, that majority decision procedures by themselves aren't legitimate. So in either case, you know, the question is whether everyone's fundamental interests are being taken into account in a reasonable way. And not, we certainly don't want to supplant uh, a majoritarian system with a minoritarian system. Now, I think you're right that majoritarian is frequently used as a shorthand for a wider political system. But it's, it's, it's that wider system and the work that it does preceding a majority vote and, and after a majority vote and making sure that uh, minority interests are taken account of, that there's deliberation, uh, due consideration of interests, that the law is applied reasonably, and so on and so forth. It's all of that that makes the system legitimate. And I do think that the, the label is so popular and uh, it, it frames uh, discussions of democratic institutions in an unhelpful way uh, because it does really suggest in, in, inappropriately, I think, that, that the rule of numbers is adequate for legitimacy. And it, it, it's, it, it, it distracts attention from the complexities of democratic legitimacy uh, uh, by, by, by duping us into thinking uh, that when numbers rule, uh, uh, the system has a presumption of legitimacy. And I just don't think it does. American society is not shaped like a pyramid. It's shaped like a diamond. <laughs> and that has been the cause of a great deal, it seems to me, of injustice. The political trope of our day is we have to care about the struggling middle class. Very few people nowadays say we have to struggle about those to, to recognize and help those at the bottom. And I think the phenomenon you call attention to, if we change the geometric figure, is quite revealing. Behind, I'm sorry. Imer Flores from Mexico. Imer Flores from Mexico. Taking sides with uh, Stephen Macedo rather with, with Jeremy Waldron, I would like to suggest Professor Dworkin not to take the lifeboat example out. Of course, I don't think he will consider uh, Jeremy's suggestion since the example is at the core of the, of the whole book. Um, 
Instead, I would like to suggest, Jeremy, to rectify your suggestion and ask for further clarification on the claims of the example to make them much more explicit. Let me suggest that the majority rule is not the one and only decision rule and less amounts for the one and only democratic decision rule. And that's the point of Dorkin and, the, and of the book, as I take it. If it is not a proper decision rule in the example, it is because it does not show equal concern for the life of the of those partners in the vote who have an equal share to, to get their life, to, to still to keep their lives. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, just to respond to that, I think in the case where there really is a disagreement of principle among the people in the, in the lifeboat, it doesn't seem to me um, that that case has been answered. Where, that is where the people really are exercised by two apparently reasonable options, but one of them has to be chosen, and chosen quite soon. And the argument that at that stage what we are primarily concerned about is respect for the viewpoint of each person on this pressing moral matter that they have to address. And I don't yet hear any uh, argument for the claim that it would be silly to think that majority decision was a fair way of resolving that disagreement of principle. Can I add one thing to, to, to uh, Robin's excellent suggestions? Even accepting Ronnie's substitution of the diamond figure for the pyramid figure, it's worth making the tiresome point that in a way Stephen Macedo is right. The question is not about majority decision as a principle. Supreme Court of the United States uses majority decision as a principle. It votes five to four in favor of supporting minority rights, or it votes five to four in favor of not supporting minor minority rights. The difference is not the use of the principle. And I have never yet heard in 20 years any reasonable explanation by an anti-majoritarian of the use of this principle by the court, and I'm still waiting for that. But, <laughs> good, lunch will be wonderful. But, <laughs> But the fact is the difference is primarily one of constituency. It's not a difference of... And so if we were to assign the decision of principle and the lifeboat to the three philosophers sitting in the stern, mm. rather than allowing the great unwashed people to have their voice on, on, on the, uh, this important moral matter, still the three philosophers sitting in the stern would probably come up with three or two or three different proposals, and they would have no choice but to deliberate and vote and accept a majority of the three of them. The Supreme Court needn't use majority rule uh, as a requirement of fairness. It may. And uh, the great unwashed like judicial review. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> great unwashed like a lot of political systems that are just <laughs> Um I also want to follow up on the, on the, on the question of majoritarianism um, and offer, if I could, a potential middle ground, not an attempt to reconcile, but a middle ground between Jeremy's position and uh, Prof Professor Dworkin's. Um, and my hope is also to draw in finding this middle ground from the, from the manuscript and from, from the book. Uh, the middle ground, or one way to understand the middle ground, is to recognize that in some instances judicial review in defense of rights is justified uh, or justifiable, but that majority rule has some, not just instrumental, but I intrinsic merit to it. So that on, on balance, that's how we, sh we would consider um, problems in which majorities violated rights. And the argument, I think, for the intrinsic value of majority rule that's, I think, present or implicit in some ways in the manuscript is that th this isn't an original position argument, right? Uh, Professor Dworkin doesn't think that we should just start to think from scratch about what the procedures, uh, ideal procedures should be in the way that uh, Rawls or Habermas uh, perhaps do. Uh, he says instead that we're born into the world uh, with a fact of a state. Well, there's also the fact of majority rule and the fact of participation in the majoritarian process. So. I think given that fact, it might make sense to ask the question of whether in an actual instance where people have debated and participated, uh, and then the court, but a right has been violated, whether the court should come in and overturn the uh, majority process. Even if it does, it seems to me there's some loss to democracy because the participation has happened. And maybe proportional representation or some other system would be better, but in actual, politics in the United States, there is majoritarian rule, and there is actual participation, and so in that actual world, there's value. And one kind of thought experiment just to show that there's at least some infinitesimal weight, intrinsic weight to majority rule, is just to ask the question of whether it would be better if a majority participating affirmed a basic right uh, 
rather than the instance in which we're faced uh, with, with uh, judicial review in defense of a right. And if you think that instance is better, where the majority affirms the right, then it suggests that there is some added value to respecting the process and to participation. Uh, on balance, I think often it might be the case that that, that that intrinsic weight might be outweighed by considerations of rights protections, but it's at least got some weight. And if it's got some weight, then it suggests that there are some instances uh, where even if majorities get it wrong, we should uh, defer to them. Uh, so that's a kind of attempt to, 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 to chart a middle, middle course and, and to try to give some, some weight, intrinsic weight, to, to the value of majoritarianism. Uh, so I guess that's Steve or Jeremy. Steven, do you want to respond? Well, just I, I think when you say majority, you're using it as a shorthand for legitimate political process, and uh, uh, you're saying that, that the operation of legitimate political processes deserves some, some, some weight. And you're also saying that the ideal democratic outcome would be, in a way, when, when, the ide when a legitimate political process works and uh, the people's representatives and perhaps the people themselves prefer the right outcome for the right reasons, respecting uh, minority rights and so on. But when the, when the process has functioned illegitimately and when rights are infringed upon, uh, then you know, that failure furnishes an occasion for judicial review. And it's not clear to me that the loss to democracy is to be laid at the feet of judicial review. Judicial, if, insofar as judicial review fix the, uh, the flawed process by insisting on respect for minority rights and so on, it, 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 giving some weight perhaps in marginal cases where there's reasonable disagreement, but leaving that aside or taking that into account, then the exercise judicial review is an overall improvement uh, in, in the process. Uh, the loss has occurred on account of legislative failure uh, in, in that case, I think. Right. Bob, can I just say just, just oh, please. Yeah. I mean, I, I accept the general shape of the, of the argument. Like Professor Dworkin, I don't see that majority decision as an unconditionally compelling principle. It doesn't follow that it's instrumental. Something can be intrinsic, but only of intrinsic value under certain conditions. And I think Professor Dworkin has done a lot to lay out some of what those conditions may be. But, but to phrase the compromise in terms of infin infinitesimal weight, it seems to me to, be, to betray a sense of what's actually involved here. It's not just a matter of there being some little modicum of value that a good consequentialist might want to at least you know, register before running roughshod over it. It's, I mean, the value involved is a value of respect. It's respect for the voices and votes of the people who took part in the majority decision. And we see what that amounts to when we imagine some people being disenfranchised. It may well be that the influence of each individual in the political system is infinitesimal. But the wrong done when somebody is disenfranchised, whether by reasons of race or felony or any of these other reasons for disenfranchising them, is massive. It, we may have to accept compromises of the sort that you say, but don't put it in terms of some infinitesimal little value like somebody's preference. <laughs> Well, Jim's getting up, so he's, he's going to trump me. I was going to see if we could take another five minutes, but uh, all right, that's that. Oh, there, I believe there were, but let me, just, let me just ask if there are hands up, and please don't feel uh, you know, deterred from putting your hand up. Uh, we can, I'm, I'm sure all our stomachs can handle another, another five minutes or so. Uh, why don't we go to the audience here? Uh, uh, yes, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, you've got it. Ted right. He, 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 he Is this on? No, great. So I, I'm really excited about this conversation about major majoritarianism. And um, I, I take it that Professor Waldron concedes that majoritarianism doesn't work very well in the specific lifeboat example. And the question that he poses is how broad can we, how, uh, what, uh, what's the breadth of the implication we can draw? So I want to just change the lifeboat example slightly and then ask whether you uh, uh, come to the same conclusion. The, example, the way I'm going to change it slightly is I'm going to ask the majority to vote on whether it's necessary to throw someone overboard. Okay, so, uh, uh, and is that legitimate? Because, of course, then the majority is going to also then vote on who. Um, and the, the reason that's a broader, a broader, broader implication is it, that's very commonly what majorities do. So, for example, in the healthcare debate right now, we are currently throwing 40 million people overboard. And the question is, should we? And then the question for you is, is that a legitimate question for the majority uh, principle to answer? And that's why I want to uh, frame it. And I don't have a position on it. I'm just right. curious to your response. Right. I mean, I can imagine somebody saying, well, this is a question of expertise. You would want the best qualified uh, marine engineer on board the lifeboat to, to tell you whether it was likely to get swamped if the seas rise a certain amount tonight with this number of passengers aboard or not. And so the case for deferring to the expert might be the classic case against 
democracy, which is that the people are ignorant of navigation and they need somebody uh, to run the ship of state. Suppose there are two experts with rival opinions on these matters on board the lifeboat, huddled up there with the philosophers uh, in the stern. And there, it doesn't seem unreasonable to say it would be appropriate for people to decide uh, whether the uh, exigency was such. But you're absolutely right, this is an interesting case because it's a particular decision rather than a general decision of, of policy, and it's not the particular decision that Ronnie focused on in his use of the example. I think we have time for one more, and uh, Gary. This is actually inspired by um, Rob Sloan's talk, but, but I'm going to address the question to Professor Freeman uh, because his designs on my wealth are the most obvious <laughs> of anyone on, on this panel. Uh, I know Michael Man has designs too, but he, he didn't talk about it as much. Uh, I take the example of, of Ruritania and, and, and Azania. One could just as easily cast that as Massachusetts and Texas or within Massachusetts, Cambridge, and any town populated by normal people. <laughs> and within any of those towns, neighborhood by neighborhood, within each neighborhood, household by household, till you ultimately could even conceptualize each individual as, in essence, a sovereign nation. So that whatever problems there are with a coherentist or constructivist project, projecting into the international arena could be brought down to the, to the same level of of, of each individual being theoretically a, a sovereign nation. So the, the ultimate question is, within uh, what I will contentiously call left liberal theory, is there anything that tells you where to draw the borders of the polity? It can't possibly be the historical accident of boundaries, can it? Because to say that you're born into a state, well, you're born into lots of things, and left liberals don't normally take that as a reason for accepting at face value what you're born into. So I'm, I'm just wondering what it is. Because if, if we're talking about an individual or a family, I'm a Dworkinian. I, I would buy into the entire Dworkinian analysis if the scope of the polity ended with my family. Um, so, so what is it that defines the appropriate moral and political scope of the polity for this whole family of enterprises? Um. Well, of course, uh, Professor Dworkin's a, a left liberal, too, so he, he may have a different answer, but uh, I, uh, you know, I, I would tend toward the position similar to Rawls is that, well, look, I mean, you have uh, these different societies, and what's specific to it, what, what makes a society society primarily is that it has certain basic social institutions. Um, and these, among these are property and whatever the uh, institutions are that make economic production uh, possible. and. Uh, the political system to, 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 to revise rules and change rules to meet uh, changing circumstances and enforce the rules and so on. Um, and that has nothing to do with, you know, the accidents of national boundaries. The, fa the fact is, I mean, that doesn't mean you have to accept the national boundaries that exist, but the fact is that those institutions are necessary for societies to exist. And that gives some reason for assigning them priority and assigning questions of social justice some kind of priority, particularly with respect to uh, it's a question of economic or distributive justice. I mean, I see um, economic systems as cooperative enterprise among socially productive agents whose uh, economic output is, is cooperative. So the question is, how do you divide this up? You know, and, and how, how do you divide up the, 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 the social product? And you know, Rawls has his answer. Well, on some basis, grounds of reciprocity among equals. Um, Ronnie has a different kind of answer, but. Uh, I think that's the reason that I would give priority to, to societies in the kind in the question of the, the justice of their basic institutions is, is that, is that uh, they have such uh, profound effects on, you know, without society, social systems, we don't, we don't have language, you know, we're just stupid, limited animals, as Rousseau says. You know, without international cooperation, we'd lose a lot of benefits, but it's, it doesn't have anywhere near the fundamental effect on, on the kinds of persons we are, I think. So that's, that, that would be my response. And um, if that, I don't know if that addresses your question or not, but it, it sort of plays around the edges of your question, certainly. <laughs> oh, I missed it. Oh, yes, Candace, please. Sorry, I closed my notebook. Uh, <laughs> I thought I missed the chance. Okay. Um, Oh, it's a question to Professor Macedo. 
So counter-majoritarian decision procedures don't necessarily entail a loss to democracy because they may actually yield gains to democracy. They may improve democratic legitimacy, enhance the quality of uh, public debate, and so on. Um, so if I understand correctly, uh, Professor Dworkin and your reconstruction of his argument, um, the assessment of procedures should be outcome sensitive. So my question is, are we left with the empirical question of whether non-majoritarian procedures, the procedure in question we would be considering, um, is in fact reliable in improving democratic legitimacy? And in other words, is the only way to rebut Dworkin's argument in favor of judicial review to show that um, in the real world, in the real, real world, <laughs> Uh, on balance, it has done more harm than wrong for democracy and for the protection of individual dignity. Uh, to the last point, yes, uh, and, and that its prospects are to do more harm in the future uh, than less. Uh, but it doesn't mean, of course, that any institution or uh, organization that improves the outcomes uh, can make contributions to democracy. It's also important that the court has, colleague Chris Eisgruber calls, an adequate democratic pedigree. You know, it's the product of a constitution that was popularly adopted and part of a democratic system. So it has legitimacy uh, within this wider system of, of collective popular self-rule. If the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff could intervene and, and enforce health care uh, reform on the country, that wouldn't be legitimate. So it's not, as you say, it's outcome sensitive, uh, but it's not, uh, obviously, the, the, the pedigree of the entire system also uh, matters. But, uh, but yes, when it, judicial review has an adequate democratic pedigree, and therefore uh, it's, it's, it should be assessed pragmatically. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I think Jim has some final comments here. There have been terrific panels this morning. We're going to break for lunch now. We'll resume at 2 o'clock with a uh, response by Professor Dworkin.